thanks guys for, for coming. Um, let's uh, have the most fun of, of uh, any of the other rooms. Um, there will be significant talk of, of Gen AI, so, so fear not. And I would argue with the, the most concrete I examples uh, that you'll hear at the conference. Uh, so you, you guys exclusively. Um, but yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Chris Sachs. I'm the, the founder and CTO of a, a company called Endstream. Um, and uh, you know, excited to talk about two topics that are, are near and dear to my heart, which are you know, streaming data and, and sustainability. Um, and I've actually spent the, the last 10 years um, you know, building real world applications that, that use streaming data and, and AI um, you know, for energy efficiency. Um, and uh, you know, that uh, I'm, I'm very proud of some of the uh, sort of energy, you know, real world energy savings um, and uh, you know, sustainability goals that uh, you know, we've helped our, our customers and, and partners pursue. Um, and I want to share some of our, our lessons and, and experiences uh, today in, um, in, in doing that, in you know, what, what kind of um, taking streaming data and applying it to sustainability can look like and the kinds of outcomes that it can deliver. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll take you through a, a, a few real world um, examples. And, and many of the examples will be sort of, I, you know, in, involve IoT data, but um, you know, which may not be your yeah, your cup of tea, but, but rest assured that the, the techniques involved um, are applicable to uh, any sort of uh, decision automation um, uh, process. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I'll sort of work, you know, work in um, you know, how, how these uh, you know, energy saving sustainability uh, techniques sort of you know, apply to, to other domains as, as we go. Um, so the way, uh, you know, what I want to cover today is I can start out going through some real world examples of um, cases where streaming data has been, um, you know, applied to making real time decisions to improve, um, you know, energy efficiency uh, in, in very demonstrable and, and measurable ways. Um, and uh, then uh, I want to, you'll see there's, there's sort of a common theme to, to these examples, which uh, is that they, they revolve around you know making better decisions, right? That's um, you know at its heart e efficiency, right? Or uh, sustainability is about making better decisions about how we use our, our resources, um, and uh, in order to do it at scale, it has to be automated. And so solving for sustainability is really sort of the same problem as solving for you know operational efficiency and, and, and better decision automation and um, and uh, in, in, in applying AI and, and other techniques for, for, for optimization. Um, and, and so there's this great alignment actually between you know, things that are good for, for, for uh, the environment and things that are good for business. Um, and uh, so we'll go through some of the, the particular, but um, sort of the, the, the application of streaming data to, to making decisions and, and, and sort of uh, using feedback loops and, and sort of controlling real world devices may be a bit foreign to uh, it's a bit different than how how Kafka data is often employed um, and so again I want to I kind of walk through what what an automation system that, that sort of runs at scale looks like um, and, and uh, it's, it's not as sort of alien or different to kind of typical uh, Kafka workflows as, as it might seem um, and then I want to double click on uh, our, our, one of the particular examples um, that, that will run through the, the, the talk of, of applying generative AI in practice to, uh, to improve uh, the efficiency in, in, in this case of uh, uh, traffic signals in, in a smart city. Um, and uh, we've, uh, you know, in production, um, are, are running generative models that are actually self-trained because you know ChatGPT just doesn't understand sensor data, um, and uh, I'll, I'll take you through how you can actually take the techniques of generative AI and apply them to other kinds of data that are you know frankly more commonly found uh, in, in Kafka anyways. At least from from my experience, Kafka is not usually working with text data, um, and uh, and it's great you know the generative AI you know with uh, the, the hype around large language models is, is, is fantastic and, and well-deserved. Um, but I think it's really important to look at other use cases besides chat assistance, um, as much as those are uh, you know, terrific, um, to, to how you apply this. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll 
drill in a little bit um, more detail there, and then wrap up with you know how to how to get started and, and apply these these techniques to to your own environment and uh, uh, you know where to look for for sustainability benefits um, uh, you know for for your own organization. So starting off with uh, with with real world examples. Um, the, the first example that I want to give is uh, around a, a, a traffic control, or I'm sorry, a lighting control application. Um, and so you see on the screen here a, a video. This is a, a shopping mall, actually just a, a few miles uh, up the road from here, Valley Fair. And so there are, there are about 2,000 smart lights that, uh, you know, they're very dumb smart lights, as, as most smart lights are. They can sort of detect, you know, presence. And, uh, and you know, adjust their brightness, but that's about it. Uh, but they are networked and they do generate huge amounts of streaming data. It's about 30,000 events per second from a, 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 you know, a single parking garage at a, at a shopping mall. Um, and this data is um, uh, you know, not the most intuitive to work with, right? You, you, you know, what, what do you do with an event that you know, says, okay, motion was detected? Right, it, it, it's kind of hard, hard to make heads or tails of. Um, but if you take all of that streaming data and you turn it into a real-time model of the whole garage and everything that's happening in the garage, and you're able to sort of correlate, you know, presence detections as they move through the garage, you can do things uh, like what this is showing and have a bubble of light that follows, um, you know, a vehicle as it moves through the garage. Um, and uh, you know, municipal lighting like this is, is a huge chunk of sort of our, our carbon emissions. Um, you know, I was shocked to learn that it, it costs something like like a quarter million dollars a year just to light up, you know, a parking garage, and and that's you know largely waste. Um, you know, parking garages are empty most of the time at at night. Um, at the same time, there it's you know really important for safety and comfort, right? That you you have light. Um, but if you can sort of use streaming data and, and, and software and AI to, to optimize that light, um, you know, what we, was demonstrated in, um, in this deployment, and, and there are dozens uh, of uh, deployments of the, the uh, same software across the country, is, is $100,000 in, uh, in savings to uh, uh, the, the customer's energy bill. Um, and that works out to about 700 tons of CO2, you know, just for a single garage. Um, which is the equivalent to taking 160 cars off the year or off uh, um, off the roads um, every year, you know, just from applying streaming data that was deployed for other purposes, sort of taking that data and then harnessing it for uh, for new purposes that uh, you know, benefit the the business in in saving them money and benefit the environment um, and actually make for a cool uh, a cool experience. Although I had a security guy tell me that. Uh, the teenagers figured out how the algorithm worked, and that if they stood still, it would go dark, so that they it would catch you know kids making out on on the roof, and uh, as soon as they moved, it would, uh, all the lights would come on. Um, so the second example is uh, around you know traffic control, and, and everybody hates waiting at red lights, right? Um, and uh, it turns out something like a twenty percent of you know the amount of time uh, all drivers spend on the road is spent sitting at red lights, um, and we, which works out to, on average, 60 hours per year per person. There's like a whole week of your life every year wasted sitting at, at red lights. Um, and there's uh, a significant amount of, of, you know, something like a third of the carbon emissions of internal combustion uh, engines comes from that time spent sitting at, at red lights. Or, um, and so if you can find ways to, uh, to, to optimize that, to reduce the amount of time you spent waiting at red lights, you know, everybody wins. Everybody's happy. Uh, you, you, you waste less of your life. And you know, we have a cleaner earth um, uh, to boot. And uh, so it turns out there's about 300,000 traffic signals in, in the US. And almost all of them are networked. And again, they are networked for a different reason. So they, um, you know, over the last few decades, uh, have have uh, these, you know, little controller chips that, that are in each traffic, uh, 
you know, in cabinets by these traffic intersections. They've been made networked mainly to, to aid debugging and to uh, allow for reprogramming the lights without having to send you know, somebody out to every street corner to open up a cabinet and, and make changes. So that use, uh, that use case for um, kind of convenience paid for the deployment of the infrastructure. But now you have you know, 300,000 traffic signals that all can generate streaming data. Um, it's, it's very high volume again, um, because these are also sort of dumb chips that just dump their state on the network every second. And so it's mostly, the data is mostly ignored because it, it's too expensive to store. It's, it's like terabytes per day you know, for even a small city like, like Palo Alto. Um, but if you can harness it in real time, and, and the data is, is sort of already centralized through uh, a, a, essentially a message bus that, um, called a traffic management system that it's sometimes Kafka. If you can figure out how to harness that data, right, you, you know, the opportunity for improvement is, is, is massive, like real tangible improvement in, in, in your, your life of you know, less, less uh, time spent waiting um, and uh, to you know, sustainability and, and, and the environment. Um, but again, a, a similar problem. What the data is kind of in, inscrutable if you look at it an event at a time, right? You know, the typical event processing approach, you know, so you, you get an event that says the light turned green. Okay, right, what do you, what do, you do with that? How do you make sense of it? Um, and, and these are the, the kinds of problems that we see across the board, even where it has nothing to do with sustainability, right? Um, you know, we're all, you know, here as, as, as Kafka users and, and consumers and, uh, you know, generating lots of event data and trying to figure out how, uh, ways to use it. And, and it can be very difficult to, um, you know, to, to make sense of that data. Um, but the, the sort of techniques that make sort of this sustainability picture work um, also can be applied to, uh, to, to any stream of data. And we'll, we'll come back to this about how uh, we use uh, generative AI models to, in order to figure out the patterns in these intersections and, and improve their, their performance. The last example is around uh, real-time power grids, uh, or um, modeling the power grid essentially in, in real time. So another, you know, the, the, the electrical grid is, is obviously central to the sustainability of our, our you know, civilization, and there, there's, there's big challenges there. There's cybersecurity challenges, uh, you know, any number of challenges on you know, reliability challenges, fire <coughs> challenges, um, and uh, you know, sustainability is just one of them. But you have a similar situation where the, the data is already available. It was deployed for other reasons. It used to be that um, you know, every, every house and apartment has a, has a power meter, right, to, to measure your energy consumption. It used to be that somebody would, would walk around to, you know, through the neighborhood and write down you know, re, uh, reading on the, the power meter. And so they, you know, 20, 30 years ago, decided to make all of these networked so that uh, you could collect data remotely. And that's what paid for the deployment of all of this uh, infrastructure. And the, the data is collected and it's, it's used to read the power meter and then kind of discarded, which is a shame because you've got this huge source of streaming data, all of the sensory input into how the power grid is performing. But again, it doesn't really, it, it's difficult to use. It doesn't, it doesn't make much sense when you look at it an event at a time. You know, uh, you know some houses, you, you know, with some you know, Mac address of a, of a meter is, is using two and a half kilowatts. Like, what, is that, what does that mean? But if you can take that, that streaming data and turn it into a real-time model of the grid, and if you know the grid topology and how things are connected so you can infer loads, now you've got something you can work with. Um, and uh, you can incorporate EV charging data. Uh, so you know, EVs are a big load on the grid. They're a big challenge for how we're gonna scale the grid. Um, but EVs often send indications that they're driving to a particular charger, right? Um, or based on battery capacity. So as you incorporate more and more context into these, these real-time models, uh, there's, there's a lot you can do with it. But, but, but you sort of have to do it in real time. It, it, it's, the data is useless retrospectively. Um, and, and the benefits, again, are, are, are huge. You can, utilities can cut their peak load capacity. You can make better use of renewables. Um, you know, re, re, the, the grid used to be very reliable and predictable. You have day-night cycles, and the, and the day cycle is really, the only variable there is, is temperature. But now that the grid is becoming more and more unpredictable, 
um, with, with big loads from things like EV chargers, a big uncertainty around, um, around you know, solar, a, a, a cloud can come over a city and wreak havoc. Um, and so the ability to be able to take that data and, and, and make sense of it is, 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 is key to you know, how we will operate kind of a uh, you know, more, more sustainable and more efficient and, and profitable future. So you see there's this kind of common theme of, of taking streaming data, of taking event data, um, and, and trying to build a model of what it, what it represents and continually update that model, not just collect the data into like a time series database and, and mine it later, because by the, you know, the goal is we want to take some action to, we don't want to just say like how wasteful were we in the past, we want to understand how wasteful are we now so we can immediately become less wasteful. Um, you know, the only time you can take corrective action is, is really in the present. Um, so there's this common theme of how do you build these real time models? Um, how do you uh, then automate different decisions, right? It's, it's, you know, lots of increasing efficiency is really about you know, making, making good decisions. And, and not just like these big, uh, you know, annual decisions of, you know, what is our sustainability initiative, um, but what are the, you know, the millions of little micro decisions that are actually determining what, um, you know, on the margins, you, you're, um, you know, your, your energy consumption and, and your footprint. And, uh, and how do you optimize that, that over time? That's sort of the core theme. And I'll point out that this is, it's not IoT specific. If you are you know, a bank, you're trying to understand you know, your risk posture and uh, you know, transaction flows and, and potential fraud, right? And you again, you know, okay, you see a transaction, you know, $60 were withdrawn. Like, what do you do with that? You can take a little bit of context and do some statistical analysis, but if you can, you know, model, you know, keep a running model of every, every consumer, every ATM, um, and, and aggregate by regions, you can now uh, start to uh, mine that for a, a lot more information. So sustainability really requires optimization of, of scarce resources, and, uh, and, and optimization really, you, you don't want to just, you know, make a good decision once. You want to make it all the time. Uh, reliably, and, and that's the role of automation. And uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, automation can be a, sort of I found to be a bit more foreign to uh, streaming data audiences who are who are used to to you know maybe are, are coming from a batch world and sort of adapting to this whole streaming thing. And uh, you know, the, the initial use cases tend to be moving moving data between data lakes, for example. And uh, you know the idea of like closed loop automation, um, although is, is you know the holy grail in a lot of you know quote, quote unquote digital transformation initiatives at, at large enterprises, honestly, it, it, I think gets dismissed often rightfully so as sort of fluff from kind of the on the line you know uh, engineers and, 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 and data scientists. But um, but but closed loop automation for a re good reason is is the holy grail. Um, and it's worth uh, exploring, like what ex what exactly that is, um, and and how it, uh, and, and how you can uh, apply the, the techniques of, of automation to streaming data. Um, but it's worth just to, to build intuition, thinking about how your own brain works and, and how you kind of uh, make decisions in, in your day to day life. Right? Um, we all start out. We you know have sensory input from our you know, fingers and our eyes and our ears. And we take that sensory input and we aggregate it in, in, our, in our brains. And then we do something really, really important, um, which is we turn that sensory input into a model, a, a mental model. If you're trying to, say, optimize your you know, route to work, if you, you still drive to work, um, right, there's no sensory input that is directly about, the, you, know, you don't get a commute message um, you know, from your body. You, all you get is the sensory input. And it's, it's really this constructed mental model that you, you think in terms of, and, that, and, and, and you learn how that model behaves. So it's, it's critically important, this idea, you're not just acting on data, you're acting on a model, and that model is informed by data. And then you, you really learn patterns, not on the data, you learn patterns on how the model behaves. And you, you start to make predictions. You make predictions about what you think might happen, and you test those predictions. And you run that in a, in a cycle, and that's how you learn. Um, and you do that all the time. You don't, you know, go and, and 
uh, train for two years, um, and then stop and say, you know, sorry, my data set is frozen in, as of 2020. Um, I mean, some of us, you know, maybe do that, but, um, and then you, you issue, you know, commands back to, you know, your, your, you know, muscles and joints to, to take some action. And that's really, right, and, and this is your stream of consciousness, right? It's an end-to-end it's an -end streaming thing. Um, and, uh, you know, your spinal cord is your, your personal Kafka. Um, and, uh, you know, real-time automation really actually works very similar to how, how humans work, right? You have data sources, you collect data from many different places, and you, you store it in a model. That model is typically a database, but I would argue that, that databases fall short in, in, in a couple ways. Then you want to run some analytics or learn some patterns in that, um, in those models, uh, make some predictions, and then either, you know, that, that's where a lot of data pipelines sort of stop, and then it's on humans to do something with those predictions. Um, but you can try and close the loop and, um, you know, run, you know, periodic jobs to, uh, you know, tear down servers or, you know, order new inventory. But at the end of the day, you're, you, you're, you're making a plan, um, you know, that sort of, you know, is related to your, your mental model. Um, then you're, you're taking action and then pushing some, you know, something back to uh, uh, a, a data sync. And, and that's a, a real-time streaming application, right, that um, a, a lot of us are building in, in, in various forms. And, and that's often the motivation for why we uh, adopted Kafka in, in the first place, right, is to, to drive these, these, these real-time applications that are going to do something, you know, sub, uh, you know substantially new and, and, and valuable for, for organizations. And uh, sort of get... Uh, you know, concrete, your sensor data, you know, it may be IoT devices, it might be, you know, machine data, logs, it, it could be click, you know, click stream data, yeah, you all know, and, um, and obviously that, that spinal cord is, you know, something like Kafka, or it might be a, a change data capture stream between databases, and, uh, you know, you may be using, you know, LLMs from OpenAI or other, you know, uh, Spark streaming uh, analytics, and the data, you know, in that, in that modeling piece, is the thing that I feel like gets most overlooked. It, in, when you're dealing in the, in the world of big data, we're sort of used to the fact that you, you collect the data and you figure out the model later. Um, and so a lot of data teams, you know, focused on data collection, they're not really thinking about the model that it's gonna feed into. And then it's an, an, you know, a data science team that comes later and it's like, okay, how do we make sense of this? Um, but that you know, can be problematic for streaming data where the, the whole point is to, to do this stuff in a stream. And so, um, uh, and, but, but databases are really optimized, you know, they, they kind of, they're like a dam in the, in the middle of your stream, right? Um, so you lose, you, you lose the flow as soon as you hit um, a, a database. And so, shameless plug for, for, for my company, um, you know, Endstream, you know, our, our focus is really enabling you know, real-time models that uh, are updated by streaming data and, and you know, preserve the stream as, uh, as you move through them. So I want to reemphasize that Decisions aren't based on data. They're based on a model of a data. Um, you know, take even sustainability stuff. When we talk about, you know, climate action, or, you know, and making decisions on reducing carbon emissions, we're not basing that on the fact, you know, the temperature outside, or, you know, hopefully not, right? You know, we're basing that on a model of, of the climate. Um, and, uh, and, and I think this is really important to internalize because that a lot of the struggles that, uh, that we, again, we see customers and partners having is trying to make decisions on events. And, and that is kind of the, the zeitgeist of you're going to do event stream processing, and, and which, is, which is great. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just in, incomplete. And, and, and so it's important to think about, well, what's the model? And, and that can really unlock, you know, baffling use cases. Like, how are we going to, you know, detect, you know, this particular case of fraud? Um, or, or how are we going to you know, um, figure out which, you know, which store to send an Instacart driver to. Right? You, you really need a model, and uh, especially as, as time, uh, you know, time, you know, decision intervals, uh, you know, get shorter and shorter, you need to be able to, you know, have those models be reflective of the real world, right? Because it's not enough to just, you, you know, the, the worst thing is to, you know, to make a decision based on, on bad data um, and, and contribute to a problem. So the obligatory, uh, uh, you know, generative AI um, section, um, and uh, I, I think th there's 
there, there's definitely something really profound, right, about about like ChatGPT, and it's 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 amazing how, you know, like wait, this thing that's just you know predicting the next token um, is able to like write poetry on on command, right? You know, there's there's definitely something going on there, um, but it's also um, I believe a rather unique phenomenon, right? Um, you've had this this major step change, largely because you have, um, the, you know, you have hundreds of years of of training data ready to go um, to to train those models, and and you know they cost a hundred million dollars to train, um, and, uh, and and that's great. There's a lot of uses for them, but but not everything in the world is is language, and uh, in, in most things when it comes to sustainability are not a matter of talking about it, right? They're about doing something. They're about they're about like real world, you know, machines and, and systems and, and sensors and, and actuators and power plants and uh, solar panels. And so, uh, but, but there's, so, so the question, an, an important question is how do you take the techniques of generative AI and apply them elsewhere to other, other non-language domains? Uh, that, that's the only way, you know, that you're gonna, otherwise it's just gonna be a, a, a chat bot, you know, that tells you to, t you know, unplug your refrigerator or something, I don't know, like that's, that's annoying. Um, so I'm gonna double click on um, the example application that I showed earlier around uh, street traffic prediction. And uh, again, this is sort of very obtuse data, you know, like the light turned green, a, a car tripped the sensor. You know, how do you turn that into a sensible picture of, of what's happening? Um, and, and, and learn and, and, and predict it. Um, so what you see on screen here is a, is a, a screen recording that was recorded live, um, but it's played back in, uh, uh, you know, in, in a time lapse to, to keep it more interesting. Um, and we're looking at uh, downtown Palo Alto, for those of you familiar, um, selected an intersection on uh, the intersection of Middlefield Road and, and University. Um, and, and this intersection is, is driven off of sensors only. Um, and so, uh, you know, a car shows up, hits a sensor, and, and that causes the light to turn. Um, but it's also a big source of backups. And, you know, sitting at red lights, I've been, I you know, grew up in the area, and uh, I've spent a lot of time sitting at that light in, in the middle of the night. Um, and uh, usually waiting for it to change. Um, and so you see there's the, uh, excuse me. Um, so these sort of three graphs on the, or uh, six graphs on the bottom, the red graph is showing like whether the light, you know, whether each sort of phase of the light is red or green, um, and the three gray lines are whether the sensors are detecting a vehicle. And these, these dashed lines are the uh, sort of the, the predicted future of how, um, you know, what, how the model thinks uh, uh, the system is going to behave. When it thinks cars are going to show up, that's what the, the spikes are on the bottom. It's, um, you know, trying to guess when, when cars are going to show up. Um, and, uh, and again, that's not, it, this is something that's unpredictable if you just look, it, it just looks like a random number generator if you look at, you know, a sensor. Um, and uh, so, um, but it's able to, to, to figure it out. It can never be 100% accurate, um, but it can work it out and then make suggestions about when, when the light will change. And then you, you extrapolate this to a whole city and you've got something you can, you can work with. And, Audi actually uses this to uh, provide countdown timers in, in their cars. So how do you how do you do that? Um, so the first step is you know to, to model the city. So uh, to you know every every intersection you want to have a, a, a real time a stateful model something that's kind of in memory that can be updated very quickly, um, and uh, and is keeping track of everything it knows to be true about its environment. Okay, this light this direction is green. This light's red. Um, and uh, from that, you, you get a, a vector. You get a, a big vector of the, the, the state of you know, each of these intersections. And uh, you, you know, again, e each intersection on its own is not predictable. And this is the case for a lot of, I think, ma machine learning and analytics um, efforts that, that I've seen fail because they don't have enough context in their models you know, for the predictability to show through. Um, and so we see lots of you know, models that are basically random number generators that fool people, um, but they're not very good predictors because they're looking too narrowly. Um, and so if you think about it, if you just kind of stuck your face in a traffic light, you couldn't make heads or tails of it, right? But if you were in a drone flying above, you would very quickly start to see the patterns. You know, the, you know, the, the light turns green over here and pretty reliably, you know, 26 seconds later, um, you know, the light changes. And, uh, and, and so what, 
Now, th this would be very expensive and hard to, you know, every environment is different. Um, and, and so uh, a trick you can apply is to, instead of training like a big monolithic model, you can train many, many small models. And, and the way you do that is, uh, again, you, you sort of build this state vector that you sort of evolve through time for every one of these, um, these entities. And uh, it does, again, doesn't need to be a, a traffic lights. These could be, uh, you know, warehouses and, and store inventory. Um, they could be, you know, banks and different ATMs and accounts or, or payment processors, right? Anything, you know, all, all the techniques, you know, Mongo is, is talking about for, for storing state vectors in a database, you can use in, in real time as well. And you, you want to assemble context, as much context as possible. So um, you want to do big streaming joins to join uh, these, these states together. Um, so that you, you know, have a higher, you know, probability that there's actually going to be correlations that are, that are visible in that. Um, and so you want to, the reason you want to be stateful is that the data volumes are actually gargantuan. And, and so you want, if you, by sending deltas and, and keeping it in memory so that you don't have to round trip to the database, you know, you, you turn, um, you know, millisecond round trips into the database into, you know, um, you know microsecond memory accesses. And, uh, you, you, you then can sample these big vectors over time and turn them into a time series. And so now um, these state vectors are kind of like the uh, you know, uh, tokens in, uh, or, or embeddings in a, in a large language model. Uh, they tend to be higher dimensional than uh, you know, OpenAI's tokens, but the models are smaller. And, uh, and just like chat, an, an LLM will have a, a sliding window of past tokens um, which is the basis for what it predicts next. You do, the, you do the same thing with these models. You have a past window of you know, what your, your recent state transitions are. And if you've got enough context and, and enough uh, history, then um, yeah, you know, for many systems, you can, you can without having to specially train, um, uh, you know, have a data scientist you know, dispatch to every intersection in the US, you can, you can self-train uh, models that, that can, uh, um, you know, uh, detect the correlations and, uh, and predict them forward. Um, so you want to, like the learning part is you want to learn a function, right? You know, just like a, an LLM is a function that maps, okay, given these past tokens, you know, what are, what's the most likely next token? Um, the function you want to learn here is given the last, um, you know, set of, of states, what's the most likely next state? And, and you train it just like, um, uh, you know, similar to an LLM, um, you, you, you run through, instead of running through strings of text, you run through, you know, strings of samples, and you can actually do it in real time um, because you can, you know, make a guess about what you think the next state is going to be, and then you can wait and observe what the real state is. So you can actually learn on the fly even without storage. Um, and uh, you measure the error between your prediction and, uh, uh, um, you know, what you observed, and you backpropagate it, and you learn. Um, and you get this function that, um, you know, at, at some level understands that, that intersection or, uh, you know, that store uh, or that cell tower. Uh, and, and, you know, given a set of inputs, you know, it, uh, will predict its outputs. And then you can play with it. Um, you know, just like you might ask, you know, slightly different questions of chat GPT and get different, you know, slightly different answers. Well, so first you, um, you, you can project arbitrarily far forward in the future. You know, the, the error will diverge with, you know, um, with, with these. Um, but you can, you can run, run hypotheticals. So you can sort of ask, well, what if I turn the light green now? Like, what will happen? Um, you know, and, and the network will go and simulate forward and be like, oh, well, then these cars are all going to stop. Um, but the way you, you sort of connect this AI to sort of sustainability and, and, and automation is, uh, you, you can basically, it, it's very cheap to run inferencing on these, so, um, and everything's in memory, so you don't have the network round trips. So you can, you know, any possible control decision, you can simulate a bit forward, and you can compare them against each other and see which one looks best. And then you take, uh, you know, the, you, the actions you take are, uh, you, you follow a path that's sort of consistent with whatever the, uh, you know, the, the most optimal um, uh, outcome is. Right, so the, the same thing that um, you know uh, LLMs are doing, it's it's legit generative AI, right? It's generating, it's it's thinking about what you know the behavior of, of your inputs are, even if they're they're fake, um, 
And after predicting each state, like each token, right, it adds that to its input buffer, and then you recurrently predict forward. And, and so it's, it's simulating forward. Uh, but it's doing it with, you know, with data about not language, but sort of the language of, of machines, the language of that, of that system. Um, and, uh, um, and, and so you can apply it to all the things that affect sustainability that aren't uh, lang you know, linguistic in nature. And, and really, you've got this uh, you know, intersection of streaming data and, and generative AI and, and control theory to take action. Um, and, and it can deliver massive returns um, uh, in terms of energy saving. But again, it, totally independent of that, um, you know, it, it's, it's a, I believe, an ideal approach to complex decision automation. Um, it, it's sort of an extension of event processing where you first turn that event into sort of the, this you know, state of a model, and then you learn on the mo you train to predict the model instead of the response to the, the event. It's, it's highly general purpose. Um, and uh, you know, in, now, in terms of AI safety concerns, I think in, in these cases, um, when you, when you're, th there's often good alignment for um, you know, you know, good business decisions and, and, and energy savings. Um, but uh, hard to say about, about other, other applications. So just a, a couple you know, points of, I, I hope you see, um, you know, there, there's you know, a, a wide tapestry of a, approaches to uh, generative AI the, you know, beyond just, just chatbots. And, uh, and that you, you know, harnessing, but, but harnessing the ideas uh, and insights of, of, of generative AI and, and applying it to you know, the, the, the kinds of things that Kafka data is usually about um, you know, can have profound impacts on um, uh, you know, efficiency um, and, uh, and, and sustainability. Um, but the, uh, you know, really the goal is, you know, the way to think about it isn't about you know, doing an analytic to sort of get a result, it's about how do you make better decisions, right? Um, you know, that, because sustainability is ultimately about, you know, these billions of little micro decisions that add up to, you know, do we have a, a, a climate or not? Um, and, and there's sort of an, an analog, right? You know, we make distinctions between like the climate and the weather, right? And, you know, people, you know, climate skeptics will point to, well, how can you say there's, you know, climate change is cold outside? Um, and, uh, Right, and, and there's a role, you know, climate models are, they're predictable um, uh, on, on the long term, you know, highly reliably. And that's really what big data does for us, right? You know, we use big data to, you know, help steer the ship on a, on a quarter by quarter basis. Um, and, and streaming data is really useful for the, those moment by moment decisions, right? Like the, the weather uh, models of, of your business, you know, is it, um, you know, are you going to have a major failure today and, you know, have to, you know, stay through the weekend? Um, and, and but those those little weather models, those those micro models of your business, that's really what you, you know, most people's time is preoccupied with. You know, is is chasing down problems and, and bugs and failures and customer complaints, and uh, and it's also the stuff when it comes to energy efficiency and sustainability. That's the stuff we can do something about, right? Those are the the you know the, the actions we can actually take to you know make sure that that you know last mile power plant doesn't have to to, to spin up. Um, and uh, um, you know, driving up costs and, and, and emissions. Um, and you know, I, I, I do want to be a broken record on you know, this idea that, that decisions aren't based on data, they're based on a model that's informed by data. Um, and uh, especially as we um, exhaust the low-hanging fruit, I think streaming data um, has had the benefit of lots of low-hanging fruit of, uh, of events that you can, you can take and, and transform. And, and, and being a, a large efficiency improvement for how you sort of continuous synchronize, continuously synchronize databases between re, uh, regions or you know, coalesce change data capture streams. But as you kind of, um, you know, more and more organizations that have deployed streaming data start asking, now what? You know, what what's next? How do we really get the, you know, the, 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 the big responses? It, it, it really comes down to, to making complex decisions that require a lot of context. They get very expensive very quickly when, especially as the you know, data rates are high, and for every event, you need to query, make five database queries. And um, you know, if you have a, a million events, now you've got five million you know, database queries per second. You know, th this is how you know, organizations end up in the, in the spot where 
they have very low latency data, but their decisions still take 10 hours because they, um, you know, if you look sort of myopically at one part of the pipeline, it's very fast. Um, but if you look end to end, it's, it's very slow and it would be extremely expensive to speed up. So taking these techniques um, of, of building these real time models that are efficient to update um, and, uh, and, and to learn on, um, you know, they, they can be applied to sustainability where you have sort of, um, you know, energy hungry uh, systems, but they could be applied to uh, decision automation um, writ large. Um, and that, you know, I, I would argue that sort of just as sort of the, the real time model of, you know, a parking garage is what enables, it, uh, you, you know, these, you know, good decisions to be made. Um, you know, a real time model of a supply chain is, is how you, you know, have better inventory management and, uh, and, and, and shopping experiences. So where to look for um, potential gains, uh, particularly on the, on the sustainability front. Um, it all comes down to energy, right? Um, either, you know, both human energy and, and machine energy, right? That's the, really the name of, of the game is, is and, and it doesn't even have to come down to doing with less, right? Let's, uh, you know, let, let's stop wasting energy lighting up empty spaces before like we as individuals have to, um, you know, start, start making sacrifices. Not that the, you know, the, the cumulative individual actions, you know, they, they definitely matter. Um, but, uh, you, know, it, um, you know, a sustainable future doesn't have to be a, a, a sparse future. It can be a much more a, a productive one. Um, you know, infrastructure is definitely a place to look. I know I'm, I'm guessing, you know, most people here don't have a city or a utility uh, or, um, uh, you know, a, uh, a parking garage. Um, but, uh, you know, servers consume a lot of energy, right? And, and for the same reasons um, that, you know, the best things that you can do to, to cut energy use and, and help that sustainability picture uh, often is, or, um, are the same things that help you save money. Um, and, uh, and, and infrastructure, you know, it, I mean, if it's expensive, it probably uses a lot of energy, right? So if you, uh, if you sort of pursue sort of thoughtful, um, you know, trying to eliminate, you know, costs, you know, without sort of sacrificing service, you're, you're probably going to improve sustainability in the, in, in the process. Um, your small improvements do, you know, uh, shouldn't be dismissed as anything that you do a lot of, even if it's small, um, you know, those, uh, those small benefits compound. And so don't, although infrastructure is a great place to look, it shouldn't be the only place to look. Um, anything that you do over and over again, um, you know, is, is likely to be a source of cost and, and emissions. Um, and another almost sort of request um, is, you know, don't hoard streaming data. Um, the streaming data tends to be used internally in an organization and not made available externally. And, and actually one of the biggest challenges that we've had, you know, where there are sustainability initiatives is that y you can't get access to the data. And not because of, there's no permission, um, and uh, not because the data isn't there, but because the, you know, it just who, you know whoever de deployed the system didn't, you know, wasn't wasn't sort of thinking about that, understandably. Um, but uh, making data available via streaming APIs so that others can come and build on your work is 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 I think an important part of of the equation because no no one organization or, or you know, institution is going to solve the whole problem. Um, and, uh, and, and technology vendors who may be, um, uh, you know, who, who provide, you know, infrastructure software or solutions that, you know, affect these systems, if, um, you know, they have a lot of power to do good if they make that, that data available. And you can often sell it, um, so it's good business too. And the uh, last thing would be, you know, to, as a sort of a request, is, you know, build knobs into your system so that, you know, they, um, uh, you know, future automation systems can, can dial, you know, can tune, um, you know, your, your own performance um, and, uh, you know, to, to sort of make any, any software or, or infrastructure that, that we build now sort of future proof uh, to, to be able to, you know, be, be automated and, 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 and unified and, um, uh, in, in the future. So thanks. Um, you know, please check us out. Uh, uh, come to come by our booth, um, booth 211, if you want to see more demos, um, hear more about uh, how how um, 
how Endstream sort of turns streaming data into these real-time models. And, um, and uh, it's a really fast way to, uh, to build streaming applications, having nothing to do with um, uh, uh, sustainability. Um, but the sustainability is you know, a, a personally important to me and um, I, I think to all of us. And you can also, it's, it's open source. Um, and uh, you can check out SwimOS, which is sort of this distributed operating system that runs these, these real-time models. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.